look through the uh, the announcements real quick and, and just make sure I get everything uh, that's uh, I'm supposed to say. Uh, excuse me, a big thank you to Denny, who's been volunteering a lot and uh, been helping uh, with the announcements and everything. And um, he set up an Instagram page. And so if you're an Instagrammer, you know, be sure to check that out. Um, and a thank you to everyone offering uh, donations and support. Uh, truly, it, it means a lot to me. It means a lot. It's very helpful in supporting this work. Uh, let me just, uh, just take a minute here and... Uh, just welcome you from my heart to yours. I mean, this, it truly is a wild time to be alive. You know, I uh, had so many precious and wonderful moments this week. And when I think back, just even this afternoon, I was laying down outside with my little girl. And we just looked up at the sky and you know, when you live in um, in Colorado, the, the sky is much bigger because of the elevation. You can see much further. And we looked out and we saw there was not a single plane in the sky. So it's completely blue, completely silent. <laughs> you know, no cars driving by. And more and more, we're, we're having precious moments like this. And then these moments are are mixed with with great tragedy you know Suze, Suzanne within the Sangha she um, her sister Linda uh, uh, Suzanne's a triplet and so <laughs> her sister Linda is one of the triplets uh, you know she recently was diagnosed with brain cancer and was put in a coma in the hospital and her kids are unable to see her and so, you know, it's, it's just crazy what we're all experiencing. You know, such silence and we're <laughs> slowing down and the earth is, is smiling with the great peace and the freedom. You know, that's, that's coming forward again. You know, people were speaking to me about um, these poems going around and pictures in China where people can finally see the sky again, you know, <laughs> because there's not, um, you know, so much pollution, you know, someone posted a picture of LA and <laughs> there wasn't, there wasn't nearly as much smog as, as there normally is. And, um, uh, it's like, how beautiful is that? But then I've spoken with many people this week who, um, they're unable to visit loved ones in, in the hospital or who aren't able to go to work and are losing all their income. And one of the things that, that Jesus taught us in times like this is can we be radically open? Radically open. If any of you don't know the story of Palm Sunday, you know, Jesus was outside at Jerusalem and, um, you know, he told one of his disciples, you know, go find me a donkey. And he told the disciples exactly where it would be, you know, tied up. And so they went and they got the donkey and, and they were wondering why he wanted this. And, but they realized as soon as that they began to come into the cross through the gates of uh, Jerusalem that there were just crowds of people in the street who were wanting to see him. And, you know, they were waving palms in the air and making way for the king. They were praising him and <laughs> in such a beautiful way. But also he knew what he was doing. He knew what he was walking into. You know, he knew what was going to happen at the end of the week. And so this is what life is like on planet Earth is there is so much divinity, so much beauty, so much radiance everywhere. And yet uh, it's, 
you know, death is in the air, sickness is in the air. You know, when I saw all those uh, refrigerator trucks in New York City outside the hospital, it just, it makes you cry to see that, you know, to imagine that, to feel that. You know, this morning I, um, my wife's been begging me to go to town <laughs> and to get some, uh, get some dirt you know, for our gardens, and, um, and so I said, okay, I, you know, I wanted to go to the garden store and get a big truckload, but it, you know, they weren't open, so I said, okay, maybe we'll go to Home Depot, and so I drove in there, and as I was walking in, you know, I just saw some other people walking in, and everyone was putting their face mask on and their gloves, and I started to walk through the store, and tears just started pouring down my cheeks. I just felt such sadness of, you know, just for our world and for what's happening. You know, when you breathe with a mask on it, it feels like you're suffocating a little bit. It's another veil, another layer of heaviness that it puts on, on top of your, your soul, your true nature. And I was walking around the store, you know, and uh, headed over to the garden section and trying to find the organic dirt. And then out of the corner of my eyes, I just caught uh, this peach tree that was, you know, speaking to me, saying, you know, look at me just shining, you know, from its pink and purple flowers, just utter radiance and love and divinity. I said, oh, look, there's hope here. <laughs> you know, this isn't the zombie apocalypse. It's not, you know, the, the absolute end of the world. You know, the sun will shine again. This too shall pass. It shall pass. You know, there can be sickness, old age, and death. But there can also be resurrection and springtime and new life. And this is what we must hold on to in these dark times is a sense of hope. And hope can come not through holding on to egoic desires or having a false sense of hope, you know, like we're all going to be millionaires by the end of the month, but rather to come into the present moment, to feel the preciousness of life, to feel the immense love and radiance that's here, to soak up the stillness the stillness. Now, the stillness has always been here. But when, you know, we're racing all the time, when we're busy all the time, rushing to work, we lose track, we lose contact with the stillness, which is our nature. We've forgotten that stillness is our nature. And we've become accustomed to that busyness is our nature. But busyness is not our nature. Stillness is our nature. Radiance is our nature. Love is our nature. And so here I was at Home Depot of all places, and you know, Jesus showed up, the Christ showed up in the form of a peach tree, <laughs> showering me with love. And so I said, okay, you know, I'm going to pick this one up and uh, this one's going to come home. It's going to come home with me. I guess I'm going to have to dig a hole, you know, <laughs> to plant this beautiful tree. And as I was, uh, you know, driving home, going up the mountain pass uh, where I live, I realized, oh, there's no leaves on any of the trees in my neighborhood. <laughs> Because I live in the high alpine and, um, you know, the trees haven't budded yet. They began to bud, but the leaves haven't come forward yet. And so all day long I had this one tree in my yard with leaves just smiling at me, radiating. In the stillness, in this sense of freedom. And how lovely it was to connect to this. 
how lovely it was to turn the news off and to be outside in the garden all day, you know, connecting with nature and noticing all these little plants coming up, all these little sprouts coming up out of the soil. And so we must be doing this now. If our head is just filled with uh, this terrible movie of the coronavirus, then we are going to greatly suffer if we forget that life is eternally rejuvenating, eternally growing, eternally evolving, and giving birth. We can get into uh, quite a state of panic very quickly, very quickly. And so before I, I forget, um, you know, I'm going to invite everyone just to close their eyes. And because Suzanne, uh, who's you know, pretty much my main assistant and the one that helps us all get here, because she does so much for the Sangha and the community, let's just invite Suzanne to be showered with light and love. And invite her sister, Linda, who's in the hospital and who's alone, to be held in the light. To be held in the light. To bless her children who aren't able to see her. May they get an opportunity to say hello and maybe goodbye to mom. And for all the people who are deeply suffering with the coronavirus, who are in hospitals alone for the healthcare workers who are having to quarantine themselves from their children, and the healthcare workers who are on the front lines, you know, the, the members of the police force and the, the fire department and all those who are first responders in the military. And let's invite the whole world <laughs> to be blessed with light and love without exception. And just welcoming a wave of love to flow over everyone, ourselves included. And so I invite you to see your hearts opening, that sense of fear or anxiety lifting and turning around and looking toward the light. Let us look away from this <laughs> terrible movie that's happening now know, in present day reality. And let us turn around and look at this present eternal light, which is shining through our eyes, shining through our hearts, shining through this earth. And let us rejoice at the absolute beauty that's here, the stillness that's here, the love that's here. Let this be a time for all of us to stop, to regroup, to contemplate a new way of living, a new way of living. You know, the great Ramana Maharshi, he often used this metaphor of the movie theater. Like we all go into this movie theater, we look forward, and we see what's on the screen. The screen is the metaphor for our, our life our life, you know, our story, where we see the character that we're so engaged with and all the hopes and dreams and struggles and nightmares and, you know, outrageous things that happen, the absolute drama. The, the mind is the projector. It's always just projecting something new, creating something new, creating another drama. But how many of us in the movie theater are willing to let go of that and to turn around directly and look at the light. Look at the light, this eternal light which is shining. How many of us are willing to give up our attachment to our story and turn around and look at this light and wake up and see the truth, the truth of freedom, the truth of stillness, the truth of emptiness, truth of impermanence, 
the truth of unconditional love <laughs> and compassion. How many of us are willing to turn around and look at that light and see that there is something here that is exquisite, radiantly divine? You know, when we're just looking, you know, frozen, you know, at that movie, and we're unwilling to look away from the movie. We become enslaved to it. We become enslaved to the news. You know, when I listen to the, the news today, one story said, you know, we're, we're getting ready to have the worst week we've ever had, and it's going to get worse for the next three weeks. <laughs> and then later I heard the president say, there's light at the end of the tunnel. It's, it's, uh, you know, we're getting over this pretty soon. We're going to be getting back to work. And so you see these opposing relative truths. And you can believe one, you know, what, you know, the president and the vice president are saying. It's you know, pretty soon we're going to get back to work. Light at the end of the tunnel. Or you listen to the doctors and the scientists who are projecting, you know, the death toll into the hundreds of thousands. <laughs> You could paint yourself a horror story or a nice movie that it's all going to get better real quickly. But how many of us are willing to turn around and look at the truth? The truth that life, human life, is impermanent, each of us. And yet it's also radiantly beautiful, radiantly divine. Incredibly still and blissful. And blissful that there's a life here that's beyond this one incarnation so how many of us are willing to turn around not to give up your role you know <laughs> not to give up on this life and this incarnation but can you at least temporarily turn around and look at the light that you are and let this light wake up in you so you can begin to live in a conscious way and respond in a conscious way to friends, to family, to yourself, to the immediacy of this moment. And so anyways, uh, I'll move on to the questions here, but you know, this truly is a, a wonderful time to have the carpet pulled out from under us <laughs> to examine our life. Say, what's important to us? What do I care about? Do I value the truth? Am I interested in discovering what it is that I am? Who it is that I am? Or am I simply interested in you know, chasing the dream and avoiding suffering? And so, um, I'm going to invite any of you and all of you. If you have a question, please bring it forward. If, um, you know, if uh, you have something live you want to, to, to ask via Zoom, you're welcome to do that. Uh, if you have a question you want to put in the, in the chat, then please, uh, you know, bring it forward on Facebook or Zoom or whatever it is. Uh, so Richard says, um, he has a question. So Richard, maybe I'll just start with your question this evening. Thanks, Greg. Um, so my question is um, making the distinction between, uh, oh, sorry, this is kind of complex, but it's going to be simple. So. I've received lots of guidance from the spiritual ego throughout my life and have blundered into all sorts of things. And however, I've also needed to individuate from like wanting to surrender everything to God to become a human being who's making decisions in the world. But then I'm also trying to surrender to the genuine will of spirit as well or, or genuine guidance. And I feel myself moving out of that. And I'm like, no, I'm going to do it like this because I'm individuating and not a person. I need to make this 
I can't rely on you to fix so yeah. Right there. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, Richard, that's a beautiful question. And, um, you know, that's something that took me, um, you know, probably 10 or 15 years of consciously struggling with that question before it really deeply uh, started to click in a in a liberated type of way. And so, you know, basically you brought forth that there's these different aspects of self. There's the spiritual superego, which is absolutely an improvement from the <laughs> just regular superego, and the fight or flight response. The spiritual superego, at least it's seeing things, it's projecting uh, an idea of spirituality it's scanning the memory for what we learned while reading spiritual text and uh, scriptures and this type of thing there's God's will that shows up in the form of of your life you know, there's this aspect of just surrendering and, and see most people think that surrender means basically to lay down and to be a doormat. But surrender is a very active thing. I think probably half the time we're invited to, to surrender that which does not serve us. And then the other half of the time we are invited to step into that which serves us. So, you know, if you have old, silly, neurotic thoughts, we surrender those. We give them over to God. We press the pause button on our own neurosis. Say, Lord, I give this to you. Life, I give this to you. <laughs> I see. I can see my trajectory, you know, from the view of the spiritual superego. I know if I don't surrender this, I'm probably just going to repeat the past. And so with the exhale, there's the letting go. But with the inhale, there's the stepping into the stepping into, if we want it to be smooth and not just um, a gamble, because we can step into anything. <laughs> you know, like right now at this moment with the coronavirus and what's happening in the world, everyone's living with uncertainty and, and they're not really sure what, what we're doing. <laughs> so we're just kind of stepping into uncertainty and kind of bumbling around and falling on our faces and sometimes it working out. But there's a different kind of way that we can step into. And so I call this listening to the quiet, clear voice of the heart. What the Buddha called pragna, heart wisdom. Can we listen to this voice? And this voice, you know, it, it will not you know, there's a good chance it will not sound like a booming angelic voice arising out of the center of your chest. There's a good chance that that pragna, it, it feels like just this gentle wave, like a cool breeze, a warmth, a lighting up, a resonance. And you'll notice that this feels really different than the spiritual superego. The spiritual superego often says things like, I should do this and I shall not do that. <laughs> you know, today was Palm Sunday. I should go to church. <laughs> I should not stay home. <laughs> you know. And so the spiritual superego, it, it has kind of a pushiness to it, a righteousness to it, not good righteousness but you know egoic righteousness or it'll have clinginess to it or it'll have fear you know the superego tends to have judgment in it but our heart speaks to us through resonance and oftentimes it'll just say something like just go that way just walk in that direction just walk in that direction. So Jesus and his, um, his disciples, 
before they made it into Jerusalem, they didn't know that there was going to be so many people waiting. So many people cheering and crowds gathered. Jesus had a sense that he needed this donkey to ride in on. And so he listened to his heart. And his disciples, they weren't sure why they were going, having to go get this donkey. They said, we could just walk into Jerusalem. But they just followed, you know, their, their teacher's wishes. And see, our teacher is our heart. And our heart is continually communicating to us through gentleness, tenderness, or sometimes we'll just feel a rush of energy. But it'll be a rush of energy that feels pure. Pure. It'll have a sense of hope in it or a sense of strength or a sense of directness. And part of our job on this path is discerning what is it that's coming from spiritual superego. What does that feel like? What's coming from my thinking mind? What does that feel like? What's coming from my emotional heart? What does that feel like? The emotional heart tends to have a lot of excitement in it or anger or fear or whatever. But prajna, you know, prajna doesn't have fear or anger or anxiety or clinging or grasping. It has resonance. Resonance feels different than excitement. And so in order to, to surrender truly and deeply, we have to listen moment by moment what's true. What's true for you? You know, the other day, um, I was out helping my wife and uh, she, she wanted me to move some uh, move some dirt around or something in the garden. I can't even remember what it was. And, and so she wanted me to pick up this bucket. And so I said, okay, I'll pick up the bucket. And I was bringing it to her. You know, so that was just like the thought in the mind. Hey, can you get that? Yeah, sure, I'll get it. But then after I took a couple steps, I felt myself just overwhelmed with grace, overwhelmed with love. I had to drop the bucket and lay down in the yard and you know my body was just overcome with samadhi. And so I laid there for a half hour, forty five minutes or however long it was. And my mind initially had the thought that, you know, Saturday was going to be a day of garden projects. But my heart was telling me, life was telling me. You're going to lay down <laughs> and I'm going to overwhelm you with grace <laughs> and you're going to sit here and look at that blue sky and watch the clouds pass on by. You're going to let go more deeply into the stillness. And so sometimes the heart will just overwhelm you like that. And other times it'll be a directive. You know, oftentimes my mind will want to keep speaking about something. But my heart just, you know, it just goes silent. And I hear that. And I listen to that. And then I close my mouth <laughs> and stop talking. <laughs> and so see, this is a form of surrender, but it's also a form of surrender when God says, go shine the light. Go call this friend. You know, God has uh, been speaking to me through my heart and telling me to call my mother more often because she's home alone and she's going stir crazy. She's a widow and she needs someone to check in on her. And so you feel this, you feel the difference, you know, of the spiritual superego saying, call your mom and be a good little boy. Versus this radiant flow that says, call your mom, call her, reach out to her. She needs a friend. And so when the heart speaks, you'll feel a sense of spaciousness in it, a sense of truth, a sense of radiance, a sense of wisdom. And that feels 
remarkably different than the consciousness of the thinking mind, spiritual superego, or the uh, emotional nature. And see, this is a path of mastery, is, is for us to wake up. You know, I use that metaphor, turning around in the movie theater and looking at the light. And so we can look at the light and we can fall in love with the light and let the light wake up within us as us. But the as us part is important. That's when we invite this light to be embodied, to speak through us. But if we want the light to speak through us, we have to learn to listen to it first. And so this type of surrender is an active thing. So we don't just go into silence and become a dumb, you know, a dumb saint. We go into silence and we have some level of awareness in the heart. Just noticing. What is my heart saying in this moment? Am I willing to listen? And so you'll, you'll notice there's many people on the path. And they know how to surrender into silence. But they don't know how to surrender into action. They know nothing about compassion. They know nothing about love. They know nothing about self-love. They know nothing about wisdom. You know, like the Buddha's eightfold path, like right speech, right vocation. And see, your heart will never truly be happy until you are living the truth, embodying the truth. And so if you don't feel happiness in your heart, if you don't feel joy in your heart, there's a good chance that your heart is communicating to you clearly, hey, you're not listening to me. I feel heavy. <laughs> you're not listening to me. You're not living your truth. You're not, you haven't stepped into your vocation. You're not speaking in a loving way. And so the heart is a wonderful barometer to, to tell us, are you in the truth? Are you living the truth? Are you embodying it? Is this light shining out from you? Or have you simply surrendered into nothingness? Which, of course, is a good start, <laughs> but we don't want to stop there. So anyways, Richard, uh, I hope that was helpful, my friend. Nice example. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. So it's all about listening. Listening to what we need to let go of and listening to what we need to step into. And both are equally, equally important. Okay. Um, let's see here. Uh, Lisa writes, why are we being tested by the carpet moved so terribly? Why this edge? Um, you know, can't we just surrender completely and find balance here? Yeah, why this edge? So, so many of us take being tested on planet Earth uh, very personally. But one of the things that if we just step back far enough and just look at this earthly reality, you know, we begin to see that God created an evolutionary world. That was God's idea. That's God's will. It's also God's will that, that these souls in the form of you and I incarnate into a human form. And so that's what's happening on planet Earth. Is God created an evolutionary world in a world like this world. You know, where we are bound by the laws of nature and also the laws of God. <laughs> so people oftentimes think, I'm just bound by the laws of God or I'm just bound by the laws of nature. If we identify with one or the other, that is an illusion in and of itself. The truth is both and. We live in an evolutionary world. We're part of a species. There's too many humans on the planet. And so this is what nature does when the population gets out of control. You know, so there's the science aspect, there's the, the, the nature aspect. 
And so from one perspective, we're not being tested at all. This is just what happens. This is just the nature of things, is what the Buddha would say. But from a different perspective, you know, because we are conscious beings, we have this opportunity to choose how we respond. And so maybe that's the test. Can you become conscious, each and every one of you, of how you respond to life, how you live your life? All of us are given this opportunity right now to stop and examine our lives. <laughs> we are all given a retreat right now to stop and examine our life, examine how we're living. Do I need all the nonsense? Do I need to go shopping every day? Do I need to buy so much, own so much, build so much? Do I need a new car every couple years? Who am I without my job? Without this career? So we're given this opportunity to examine all these things, Lisa. And so I encourage you to deeply surrender, to open your heart and see truly what is this time about for you. So instead of thinking that God is testing you, like making you pay for your sins or trying to turn up the heat in some arbitrary fashion, can you step back even further from your own personal identification with the suffering and the difficulty of it all and say, what can I learn from this? How can I grow? How can I open more fully, completely, and deeply? How can I surrender my own human will and step into God's will? How can I step into the present moment right here, right now? I see that the carpet being pulled out from under us can be tragic, and yet, also, again, if we see the carpet in our human life, you know, being pulled out, if we turn around and look at that projector and see that God is here to love us. God is here to awaken in us as us. God is not here to punish us or to test us. God wants us to wake up. And can we join her in that? And so, beautiful question, Lisa. Um, Okay, um, here's someone else writes, uh, hi friends, uh, this is from Brittany, second time here, enjoying the space to commune, this quarantine has illuminated to me just now how separate I've been keeping my spiritual life and practices separate from my home life, beautiful, this is good to see, it's been really interesting trying to navigate an integration of the two with my partner, my child, um, any tired and true words of wisdom here? I mean, I know it's all spiritual when I drop down into the heart space. Well, Brittany, you, you answered your, your question right there. I know it's all spiritual when I, when I drop down into the heart space. And so as a mother and as someone who's in relationship, Brittany, can you see your child? Can you see your partner? from a place of divinity, from your heart. So it's easy during a crisis to just live in utter separation, me against the world, or poor me, or victim me, or this is too much, or oh my gosh, I'm so stressed out, or whatever, whatever it is. But crisis is, uh, crisis, however you say that, <laughs> They invite us to step, step inward and, and find something deeper, to reach deep within. Sometimes we become so stressed out that we fall on our knees and we look in a different place than our mind. And so it is true that all is God. It is true. Doesn't mean we have to like it. It <laughs> doesn't mean it's going to be simple. But it is true that everything is made of grace. Everything is made of light, literally. When we come into our heart, 
we see God here on planet Earth, as well as in heaven, as well as in our consciousness, we see it everywhere. So the heart is an intimacy instrument. It's all about intimacy. You know, the third eye area, you can kind of be removed from life and transcendent. But when you come down into the heart, the heart is a space of love and intimacy, radical intimacy. The heart is a space of intimate oneness. The third eye area is transcendent oneness. You can see, you know, all is one, but <laughs> I'm in the world, but not of it. When you come into the heart, you see that all is God, radiant and divine. Even difficulty, even stress, even hell. And the more you breathe into that, the more you open into the hell or the difficulty or even a, just a wall that we've put up between this is my spiritual life and this is my worldly life. The heart wants nothing more than to erase that wall. The heart will never be happy until all walls are dissolved. The heart will never be happy until all walls are dissolved. And to make this very practical, it means we must be willing to feel. To feel. So when I was uh, speaking with Suzanne earlier this evening and she was telling me about her sister, I felt immense sadness along with immense love, along with immense spaciousness, along with an immense connection with Suzanne and connection with God. As I lifted her, you know, her sister Linda up before God said, Lord, will you take her? Will you hold her? And see, the heart is not afraid to feel and it's through the doorway of feeling that we discover this intimate oneness with all of life. And it's a oneness that's grounded, that's tactile. You feel it in your bones, in your cells. But it requires that you're willing to feel. And the beautiful thing about the doorway of the heart is, it, is that it simultaneously invites us into, the, bell, into the, the doorway of the belly, the doorway of the hara, which is the doorway of courage and indestructibility. So the fight or flight response is always telling us don't feel that which is painful. You know, hide from that which is painful, run toward that which feels good. And see, that keeps us separated. That keeps us divided. That's how we put up walls, just through that one primary mechanism. Basically, it comes down to I don't want to feel anything uncomfortable. But if we truly want to be liberated and experience oneness in a unified way, we have to be willing to feel. And in order to feel <laughs> that which is difficult, our belly, we have to be connected with the energy of the belly, which is courage. And as we do this, the fight or flight response begins to fall away. Separation begins to fall away. And our eternal nature begins to come forward. You know, this is the resurrected Christ within us, where we see that who and what we are is beyond name, beyond form. It's not just something that opens and closes, it's something that's eternally here. Eternally here. The Christ is eternally here in all of us. And so oneness is possible for all of us if we're willing to feel and begin to erase these separations. So thank you, uh, Brittany, beautiful question. Um, it looks like Kate has a question, and uh, I know we're getting near the end here, Kate, so just try to be succinct with your uh, question. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I have a friend who I met here. Yes. Like my Kundalini brother. We're going through like a very similar thing. At the same time, we have to take a lot of comfort in each other in the connection and um in addition to the suffering i'm experiencing raging things today and i'm trying to be here for him in a really present way he's like actually suicidal and yeah. i'm wanting to comfort him and yet i know how much he's suffering and i can't say like stay because it feels inconvenient so just wondering if you had any 
words for me to give him or any thoughts about the whole, the whole program? Yeah, so, so say that last part again about uh, staying because it feels inhumane. It's like, I know that the suffering is so great, it almost feels like an inhumane for me to be like, no, just stay. Like, I know how much he wants release. Yeah. So, like, of course I want him here. I'm trying to encourage him, but I almost don't believe my own words. Yeah. It's a loss of the end. He's yeah. Noted. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, that, that makes perfect sense. And so. Any time when we are in crisis, when a friend is in crisis, uh, when we don't, you know, necessarily believe what we're saying or what we're thinking, uh, that's a great moment to call upon God, to come into you, to hold you, to come into your friend and hold your friend. You know, we all need to be held at various times on the path. <laughs> There's... There's just times when it is too overwhelming for our own will, our human will, or what Richard was describing, that um, spiritual superego trying to hold ourselves or trying to love ourselves. You know, there's a time for us just to call upon God and say, Lord, will you hold me? Will you hold my friend? Will you hold all of us? You know, so that so that this, this difficulty, this anxiety, this, this fear can be lifted from my consciousness, be lifted from my friend's consciousness. And so it's important to have a connection with God. And I like to think of God in the form of the Divine Mother, you know, a heavenly, gentle, surrendered mother. Not, you know, if we're really suffering, don't call on Kali. <laughs> don't call on Kali, you know, because she'll pull out the carpet even further. You know, call upon Mother Mary. Call upon Grace. You know, oftentimes when I'm struggling deeply, I have to just come back to this basic mantra of laying down flat, holding a hand on my heart, a hand on my belly, breathing into the one who's panicking, who's freaking out, who's doubting. You know, holding the one in the heart, saying, I love you. And on the exhale, it's okay. And the, 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 the it's okay may simply mean it's okay to cry. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be frustrated. It's okay to have anxiety. It's okay. The space here is big enough for my pain, my feeling. The space is big enough for all of us. For all of us. And oftentimes when we feel so overly identified with the pain, it means we're looking too closely, you know, at that movie camera. And we need to turn around to that which is eternal. We need to come back to the light and know there is something here within me, which is awake, which is aware, which is radiant, which is divine. Can I turn around and look toward that? If I simply look outward at life and the craziness of life, or if I simply look at my symptoms and all the crazy, bizarre, difficult feelings of anxiety and pain, you know, sometimes we can drown in that. Sometimes we need to press the pause button on that and turn around and just look. Look at our soul. Look at how beautiful your soul is, Kate. Look how beautiful your friend's soul is. And see... That even if they cannot stay, there is something here within them that is eternally awake, eternally divine, and is already staying. Is already staying. There's something here, a light that cannot be turned off. And so in order to have faith in this, we have to be willing to put the pain down at least temporarily and reconnect with our true nature. And if that's too much, call upon God to hold you and to show you your true nature, to hold you like a child, you know, even while you cry. So thank you. That's a beautiful, beautiful question, of course. Um, okay, so I have a couple questions here also I better get to. Uh, this is from uh, William. Hi, Craig. I have a question about Kundalini and... Uh, and uh, Oh, wait, this one's from uh, Wes. Uh, uh, hi, Craig, I have a question about kundalini and sound frequencies. I've been laying down, listening to 
uh, layered textures of sound frequencies as the kundalini continues to flush old energy karma out of the system. I notice that if I isolate and focus attention on a particular frequency in these soundscapes, the energy body and the chakras respond. Lower frequencies activate lower chakras, higher frequencies activate higher chakras. With focused attention on a frequency, it seems to accelerate the flushing out process and the clearing of the chakra centers. The question is, is this a dead end? Is it better to drop all effort and let the kundalini process unfold without any intentional direction of attention? I hope the question is clear. Wes, no, what, what you're doing is wonderful. It's beautiful. And so I like to think of doing both. We surrender completely and just let go. And we let God take over the process. But sometimes God speaks to you through your own discernment, through your own wisdom. God wants us all to be masters here on planet Earth. And so what you'll find is in each of the different kundalini centers is, it, is an intelligence and a voice, a resonance like you're discovering. And in order to live in a masterful way, you want to listen to these things. You want to learn from the kundalini, learn from the energy. The same way many people right now are learning about stillness. <laughs> they say, no, I'm not working. I've surfed the internet for 12 hours straight. I'm completely bored. Maybe I'll go outside and go on a walk and open to stillness and let the stillness speak to me. Let life speak to me in the form of stillness. Life is speaking to you, Wes, in the form of Kundalini. There's so much intelligence that's possible for human beings. Each chakra center is like a different mind, a different brain, and within it is immense intelligence. And so I encourage you to listen to that and let it guide you from the inside out. Now, don't get too strange or weird about it saying, you know, this chakra is red and this other one is green and that means something. Let it speak to you. Let it show you the true meaning of it all. And it will tell you when to let go, when to open up more. It will speak to you in a different voice, like the voice of the third eye will feel much different than the voice of the heart. And so I encourage you to be masterful and listen and see what comes forward. Okay, here's a question. Uh, this one's from Will. Hi, Craig. I've committed a series of, uh, of offenses that have left me internally scatter, uh, shattered, so serious that I seem to have been deserted by God himself. At the time, I had no idea of the harm I was creating. It seemed just playfulness. Of course, now I understand desperately, and I want to return to the path and spiritual practice. The karma is terrifying. Is there any way back? What do you think? Is there any way to reverse karma? Is there any way to avoid a serious rebirth? Um, basically, it works like this. If you do something bad, you will burn an eternal hell forever. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Listen, we all do outrageous things. We all do crazy things. We all do terrible things. You know, some of my uh, most recent incarnations... I was a soldier on the front lines of battle and, you know, I shot and killed many people and then eventually I was shot and killed. And so I was born into this world in this lifetime and God wasn't punishing me eternally for, you know, fighting in war and killing people and this and that. We all have uh, done terrible things throughout the various incarnations. And so, Will, I, I was just joking with you in the beginning there, and so I encourage you to smile, to take a deep breath, to let it go. And the way to reverse karma is very simple. You look at your actions and you commit to not repeating them if they're actions that cause pain. You know, Jesus came to this planet to say, you are forgiven. You know, you didn't make yourself a human being. You didn't make yourself an animal being with this fight or flight response or, you know, these desirous drives or whatever it is that you feel like you did that was so terrible. We've all done terrible things. 
you know, what life is looking for, looking for from you, is that you look at your life, you reflect deeply, you see what's wrong, you listen to your heart, you admit it's wrong, you ask for forgiveness, you apologize to the people that you harmed, and you grow from it, you learn. All of us are growing out of being an animal being into a human being, out of a human being into a divine being. Our animal nature has war, violence, you know, uh, rape, all kinds of genocide, just horrific things within it. You know, animals eat other animals alive, and we have that within our consciousness. But we also have these amazing hearts. If we want to reverse our karma, we listen to the goodness and the innocence and the beauty of our hearts. And one of the, the first things that we have to do is we have to see that we are good. We have to believe that we are good. We have to have a sense of hope. As if you just beat yourself up in a way where you think you're going to burn in eternal damnation, what you do is you put a wall between you and God and say that God is not with me. God has not abandoned you, Will. God is fully here with you. Fully here with you, inviting you to come into heaven, to descend into heaven. Within the space of your own heart. Can you listen to that? Can you listen to that? And so, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure being here with all of you, truly. I want to uh, deeply thank you all for your donations and your support. And I look forward to uh, seeing you all again sometime soon. My heart is with you during these dark times. And so I invite us all Invite us all just to put down the tragedy, the story, the pain, the hell that's before us and reconnect with the hugeness of what you are. Okay, everyone. Bye for now, and I'll, uh, I'll see you next week.